Um, Larry and Lance, who you heard from last week, um, organized a, uh, a conference on mechanics and developmental biology. Um, was that last summer? Yeah, it was. Yeah, just last summer. Um, which, uh, really, uh, I think the two communities got together in a formal way and really, I think, has started to ignite a lot of interest in the part of for the engineering side uh, in development and, and how the mechanics can be applied to development. Uh, Larry, and Larry, Larry especially, but Lance as well, uh, are really, the, I think, the two uh, individuals who have really developed the interest on the engineering side. And Larry's been working in development from various perspectives for, uh, uh, for a few years. Actually, <laughs> actually, probably 20 years now. 20 years. Yeah. So pro probably, I mean, you must have been one of the first engineering side people. Well, yeah, yeah, because Lance was really biophysics, so he doesn't count. <laughs> but he was, he started before I did. But, but so, um, so Larry really is, is a pioneer in the field, I think. and he's going to pick up where Lance left off. They had actually coordinated a little bit, and uh, Larry's going to look more at the more advanced stages of, of development. Um, so I won't take any more of your time. Look forward to your lecture. Okay. Well, so, so thanks a lot, Roger, for inviting me. It's always good to come to Boston and MIT in particular. And if anybody ha has questions during my talk, just don't don't hesitate to ask. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to focus. Lance talked to you about early development. You heard a lot about development from Ray Keller uh, last week, uh, and so I'm going to talk more about the modeling side of development, because that's really where my expertise is. So as far as uh, mechanics goes, we can divide development into three main processes. First, there's growth, which we can define simply as a change in volume. Remodeling is a change in, in properties, primarily when we're talking about material properties. And morphogenesis, which is, which is a change in shape or form. And in, in, in reality, all of these processes are coupled together but uh, it's useful to separate them out. And so today I'm going to talk about primarily morphogenesis. And here's an outline of the, thing, the topics I'm going to be talking about. First I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic, basic theory for modeling morphogenesis. And then I'm going to, going to talk a, a, about, uh, outline a procedure that, that I recommend for modeling morphogenesis, at least at the tissue level. And morphogen morphogenesis really is a process that is that uh, that you observe at the tissue level, but is driven by uh, the cell level. Then I'm going to uh, focus on uh, several specific problems: gastrulation, which you already have heard a lot about, and then uh, the rest of the talk will be on on, on really development of organs, neurulation, development of, of the uh, neural tube, brain development, eye development, and finally stopping uh, ending up with heart development. So first, let's talk a little bit about theory. Now, as the statistician, George Box, that said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is particularly true in modeling of biological systems. And let's, let's break this down a little bit. Why are all models wrong? And that seems, it's really pretty obvious. Because in biology, it's, it's just impossible to include all possible effects. And because of this, you have to make simplifying assumptions and approximations. And, it, and, and, and a lot of people talk about validating a model, but really you can't validate a model. The best you can do is test a model. You can test it a million times, and maybe the next time it will prove it wrong. So you can never fully validate any model. But on the other hand, even though this is true, some of these models are useful if they're a good model because they un help us understand the behavior of the system. And this is really the, the main use for it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and they also can provide information, such as wall stress and mechanics, that can't be measured directly. And some would argue that models can be used to make predictions. Now, I question that because mod predicting the behavior of, of a biological system is a lot like numerical weather prediction, only much harder. They both involve complex physical processes that depend on a very large number of parameters, and many of these parameters have unknown values, especially in biology. Uh, both in involve uh, unknown initial conditions, but what makes biology uh, a step harder 
is because, they, because biological systems also must obey the laws of evolution. So they must adapt in order to survive, and this means that the system is constantly changing. The parameters may be constantly changing on you, and so it makes it even more difficult. And so predicting the behavior of, of a biological system is inherently less reliable than predicting the weather. And actually, the weather predictions have gotten, over the last 10 years or so, relatively reliable. Not always, but usually. Now, in, in modeling morphogenesis, there are a number of other specific uh, challenges that, that, that come in as far as, uh, as far as mechanics is concerned. First of all, more, most, morphogenetic, morph, most morphogenetic processes involve very large deformations, the contact between different tissues, and fusion of tissues. They involve active and passive forces at multiple scales from the, from the molecular level up to the tissue level, or an organ level. Um, and, there, and what makes it really challenging is that you can have multiple mechanisms that can generate the same shape. For example, if you want to take uh, a tissue and, 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 and if, if the embryo needs to make it get longer in the uh, uh, vertical direction in this case, they, all the cells in the tissue can undergo this kind of a, cha a shape change to make it become longer, or the cells can exchange neighbors while maintaining their own individual shapes to make it become longer, and there are other possibilities, such as passive stretching, anisotropic growth, or, which is, can be either cell multiplication or hypertrophy, where each cell becomes longer. And there, there, there are other possibilities. Also, the natural biological variability um, makes these problems uh, challenging. In particular, in morphogenesis, which, which, which really um, unusual is that if you watch something develop, if you watch an organ develop, Intermediate stages may be high, relatively highly variable. You, they may not even look like this, the same uh, structure in a lot of cases from one individual to the next, but they end up all looking the same. So the heart may look a lot, quite a bit different as, through the steps it takes in development, but it ends up pretty much look, looking like the same heart in, in all cases. Also, because of uh, uh, the uh, adaptation, you will always have backup mechanisms. So when you, ex when you experimentally uh, perturb the system, that's, that's, a, that's a common thing that developmental biologists do to study development. You perturb the system, something happens. The problem is you don't know if, it, if, the heart, if, I mean, if the heart or whatever organ you're looking at, if nothing happens, you don't know if it's just adapting to the, to the perturbation. The perturbation actually may be doing something, but it's adapting and you won't know that it's happening. So it makes, it, it makes that really hard to decipher. Also, these problems are regulated by both genetic and environmental factors, and among the environmental factors is mechanics. So, in the embryo, the genes are, are like management. They have the plans, they supply the materials, and they issue instructions, but it's really the cells and proteins that do the heavy-duty lifting of constructing an embryo. But, in it, in, but, but a cell really only has a limited number of tools in its toolbox for morphogenesis. They can uh, divide and die, they can grow larger or smaller, they can undergo sh uh, active sh changes in, cell in shape, they can migrate from one place to another in the embryo, and they, can, and they adhere to other cells and, and other tissues, and, and also in matrix. But there, are real, but there really are an un unlimited number of ways that these tools can be combined to construct an embryo. Okay, so anyway, what I'm going to talk about just briefly here, you heard uh, from Jay Humphrey last week, uh, he gave a lecture on continuum mechanics, and I'm going to talk about, just briefly uh, outline a, a, a continuum-based theory for modeling morphogenesis. And to set ideas, to fix ideas, we'll start at, with a 1D problem, simple growth and loading of, of a bar in the axial direction. Say so that the bar starts out when it's created in the embryo with no stress, length L0, it then grows into a new length L sub G. If the growth is uniform, um, then, then the stress will still be zero, and this represents the current zero stress state. Then we load the tissue with the stress to bring it to its final length L. So these three configurations are linked by three what we call stretch ratios. So first going, the growth is defined by this this stretch ratio G, which is just a ratio of, of, the, gro of the grown length, of the zero stress grown length divided by the initial length. Lambda star 
is called the elastic stretch ratio. It's the final length, the current length, divided by the grown length, zero stress length. And then the total stretch ratio goes from the initial configuration to the final configuration. And these three stretch ratios are related by this simple equation, as you can see by multiplying these three quantities together. So the key to this process is that the stress depends only on the elastic stretch relative to the current zero stress state. So growth itself, if you, if you culture cells in a dish and they, and they grow uniformly, those of you who are mechanical engineers know about thermal expansion. If you have a bar and you heat it up, it will grow into a, a new size, but, but it doesn't develop stress unless there are constraints on the problem. And then, then it will develop stresses. So the stresses depend only on, on, on the stretch from the, from the current zero stress state to the current state. Okay, so uh, about uh, almost 20 years ago, Rodriguez et al. Uh, extended this theory to three dimensions. And to get the basic idea, we, we consider a series of virtual configurations where we start out with a body, again, uh, B at T0. When it first forms in the embryo, we assume it's under conditions of zero stress, which, which probably is not really true, but we just assume that. Then we imagine that we cut this body into a set of infinitesimal pieces, and which then grow through the growth tensor G to form the current zero stress state. Okay, So these have grown. Each of these little pieces has grown without the generation of stress. Now we want to reassemble these pieces into the intact body. In general, these pieces will no longer fit together like the pieces of a puzzle, and they require deformation to make them fit together. They could each grow to, to different shapes and different sizes. And so, and that, and that produces residual stress, which is a, defined to be the stress in the unloaded body, um, in a body that's unloaded, I guess. Okay, and then we load it up to give the final configuration. So, as with the 1D problem, the stress in the final configuration depends only on the elastic deformation, F star, relative to the current zero stress state. And, uh, and, and this, this equation uh, defines the total uh, deformation gradient with respect to the, the, the uh, uh, elastic deformation gradient tensor and the growth uh, tensor, similar to what was in the previous slide for one dimension. Okay, but modeling morphogenesis, the key to that is this, this tensor G the growth tensor. So it can be either specified as a function of time and place in the embryo, or it can be found through some sort of feedback law. Okay, so let me just illustrate this with a, a very simple problem where we have, uh, we, do, we have a beam composed of two layers, and the bottom layer is going to, we're going to specify longitudinal growth, while the passive layer remains passive. The top layer remains passive. And as you can see, when you do that, it bend, it's like a bimetallic strip when you heat it up. And it bends all the way around. It'll come all the way around in a circle. But you can consider this as, as a beam that's cultured in a dish. And if it bends this way, there will be no loads on it. But you can see that there's actually a relatively complex stress distribution that builds up inside. And those are the residual stresses. OK, so now next I'm going to talk a little bit about a modeling, modeling procedure for morphogenesis. So, modeling of biological systems is something of an art. And in, in my view, it's, it's, it's best to follow the, the advice of Albert Einstein, who said to make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And so that, by that I mean, we, we begin with a relatively simple model that contains a minimum number of free parameters, um, and then we determine the parameter values by matching normal morphogenesis. Okay, so this doesn't mean that you, that, uh, that you start out with the most complex problem, the most, most realistic problem to solve. You start out with something that that's, that's makes reasonable, it seems reasonable to you. You include the, 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 most, the most information, the, the least amount of information that you think you can get away with and see what happens. Okay, and the next step is to test the model using as many different types of experimental data as possible. And then matching global morphology, as we'll see, is not enough. This is really, most uh, people who model morphogenesis say they match the shape and that's good enough and they stop. And that proves that the model is, is, is fine. But that's really not enough. And so we need to also compare regional stress and strain distributions and whatever else we can think of. Okay, so next 
we'll find out usually that it doesn't match something, and so we refine the model until it captures the fundamental trends in the data for no normal, normal morphogenesis. That means that we don't worry too much about quantitative uh, matching right now. We're talking about qualitative behavior. Then the next step is to test the ability of the model to predict abnormal morphogenesis. So first we start out by, by matching normal morphogenesis, then we test the model because it should also be able to predict abnormal morphogenesis, which is caused by experimental perturbations. If the model is correct, it should be able to do that. And it, then usually that won't work, and so we refine the model further. And we keep doing this and then until we finally have what we think is a reasonable model, and then we, and we, we conduct parameter sensitivity studies to explore the robustness of the model to show what, which parameters are the most important in your model. Okay, so I'm going to use a, a, a simple example to, to illustrate this. And I'm going to go through the steps. This is a problem that we studied uh, oh, actually over a period of, of a few years. And, and I just want to show you this, some of the steps that, that, that you go, might go through to develop a model. So this is the problem of headfold formation which is really the first three-dimensional structure to form in the vertebrate embryo. And it, it initiates brain development, heart development, and foregut development all at the same time. And these pictures are pictures, uh, are, this is an OCT image of a chicken embryo at about 20 hours of incubation. The head fold is this, this crescent-shaped uh, bump up here. And down below that is the neural plate, which is a relatively thick layer uh, in the blastoderm. If we look at a longitudinal slice of this embryo, you see that it starts out relatively flat. This is the embryo up here. The down below is a vitelline membrane. Um, so it starts out relatively flat, and gradually you see over a period of a few hours that the head fold develops, which is actually this part of the fold. And notice how it contacts the vitelline membrane below it. So um, people have actually studied this problem for since the late 1800s, but still it's not, a, not clearly understood uh, what is the cause of, what are the mechanical causes of headfold formation. And uh, so several researchers over the years have speculated that the notochord plays a major role in this process. The notochord is, is a relatively stiff rod that grows longitudinally during, during a headfold formation. So this is the headfold up here, this is the notochord. And so if you consider a relatively simple model, we have, we have a plate and we have this, this little notochord here, and we're going to allow it to grow. And when we do that, we see that it pushes the plate up, makes it buckle into a crescent-shaped fold, which looks somewhat like what you might expect it to look like. Problem is that, 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 that really the cross-section is not, is not really right. We could have probably modified this, but instead you do an experiment to see if the notochord really does have a, have a play a major role. And so, the, so this is an embryo. The head fold will f eventually form here. The notochord is down here. And so we cut between the head fold and the notochord to relieve the stresses. And as during development of the head fold, this hole becomes larger and larger, pushing the notochord downward, and, 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 but we still see a head fold form. And so this would indicate that, um, that this cut doesn't disrupt head fold formation, and so we reject the hypothesis that the notochord plays a major player, is a major player. There we go. Okay, so next we looked at uh, another hypothesis that included two major um, driving forces. So if we look at an embryo during head fold formation, we see that uh, uh, if, we, if we look at the neural plate, it's outlined, it's dotted, outlined here in the dot, head fold would form here. During head fold formation, you see that the neural plate becomes longer and narrower. And this occurs primarily through the process of cell intercalation. We can model this process within the neural plate as positive growth in the longitudinal direction, negative growth in the transverse direction while keeping the surface area constant. We also know that the cells within the head fold become wedge-shaped. Okay? So they go from this kind of a shape to this kind of a shape. And we can model this process as a positive growth on one side of the neural cell, uh, one side of the plate, and neg neg negative growth on the other side to pre to generate this trapezoidal plate, uh, trapezoidal shape. And I must, I have to point out that the cells in this region, in the neural plate, are tall and skinny. They're, they're, the, the neural plate is one cell thick, composed of tall, relatively thin cells. Okay, so we put this, 
into a three-dimensional model now, a finite element model using our growth theory. It's a two-layered model. The top layer is the embryo. The bottom layer is a vitiline membrane. The uh, a neural plate is represented by this rectangular region here, actually with a little cap on a little hemispherical cap on it. I guess a cylindrical cap on it, and a, uh, uh, and cell wedging is is presumed to occur in this future headfold region. So we 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 actually these lambda G should be G's, I guess. I forgot to change those things. So we simulated both these processes in these two regions, and if you turn it on, turn on the model, you will see that you do indeed get. What, look, what appears to be a, uh, a, a raised uh, head fold here. And if we look at a cross section of the model, I should say this is a line of symmetry here. If we look at a cross section of the model, you see this is the shape generally for the head fold, and it looks very much like the experimental shape. So the predictive shape is relatively accurate. And again, you might think, okay, you're, you got it, you're done. But as I, as I mentioned before, shape really is not enough. It's not always enough. Sometimes maybe it is for what you need, but usually it's not. And, and again, let's return to this relatively simple model that I talked that I talked about before. So we, we have we have a growth of one layer in a bilayered a beam, curls all the way around into a circle, and and uh, uh, this is a specified growth in the bottom layer. No layer in the top layer, no growth in the top layer, and we get these stresses. We can also generate the same shape by just modeling cell wedging, which is a growth, a, a linear growth distribution across the beam where it's positive on the bottom side and it, and it, and it becomes negative on the, on the top side. Linear distribution curls around into a circular shape, but there's no stress. So in this case, you have, the, you have the possibility of two shapes that are essentially the same. One gives complex stresses, the other gives no stresses. So it means that you don't know which of these two mechanisms may be correct, or it may be some other mechanism. Just by looking at shape, it's not good enough. So you need more data. And, and one easy thing to do in, in, for engineers modeling morphogenesis is to measure strains. And because you can put labels on the embryo, in, in this case, we labeled two different layers. The blue la la uh, labels were the endoderm, and the red labels were the ectoderm. This is really essentially a two, two, two layer, uh, mainly two layer problem. And we can track those labels in time and compute displacement maps. And you can see the displacements are relatively complex. Uh, and note that inside the neural plane here, that, that the two layers actually slide relative to each other, whereas outside they move more or less together. From those displacements, we can compute uh, strain distributions. And uh, so, what we found was that the longitude, oops, oh, it's okay. We found that the normal strains, the longitudinal transverse directions were, were reasonable, but the shear strains don't match. In particular, we found that, uh, uh, that there was a, uh, was a discontinuity in the model across the border between the neural plate and the region outside it, whereas they were relatively continuous across that border in the embryo. So these results would suggest, and the reason for that is because the neural plate is thicker, so it's stiffer, mechanically stiffer than, than the region outside that, the surface ectoderm outside that. And so that would allow for less shear within the, the neural plate itself. So these results might suggest that the shear modulus of the neural plate is smaller than, than that of surrounding tissue. Because in the model, in this particular model, we assume that shear modulus was the same everywhere. So if the shear modulus is smaller, it might, might make the, 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 the neural plate region less stiff. So we measure, uh, use microindentation to measure the mechanical properties of the embryo. And these, so this is the neural plate outlined here. These colors correspond to the axes up here. So the green is actually outside the neural plate. The X is right where the head fold is going to form. And these others, uh, these, two, these two reds, and I can't, oh, I guess there's two red ones, are inside the neural plate. And in general, during development, this is over a few hours of development as the head fold forms, see that in general, the tissues in all regions become stiffer from the microindentation tests. 
And also note that the head fold is stiffer than any of the others. And that's really because of the curvature in the head fold. Okay? But, with the, and, and it also shows that the neural plate, as you might suspect because it's thicker, is stiffer mechanically than the parts, the regions outside the neural plate. But, these are microindentation tests. This doesn't tell you what the shear modulus is. The shear modulus, so the, so the, the stiffness of the microindentation test is, is proportional to the thickness cubed. And so if you take into account the geometry, you'll find that, that the modulus within the neural plate is actually about 25% that of the surrounding surface ectoderm. So if we come next, we just include that possibility into the model. And what we find is, is that, the, that uh, uh, the shear strains are much better than they were before. But the shape of the head fold, which is we had here with the stiff neural plate, with the softer neural plate, is not the same. It kind of un, it becomes V-shaped, which is not normal. This is the normal shape. And the, the reason, for, reason for that is because this blue layer, which is now softer, isn't strong enough to push this blue, this, this actually up here. Wait a minute, I got it backwards. Yeah, that, no, I have it right. It's not strong enough to push this part underneath as much. Okay, so something is obviously missing from the model. So we go back to the literature, try to dig up, see what, what else may, may be a possibility. And this, this experiment by Morgan Schoenwolf gives us a clue. What they did is they cut off a region above the head fold and they cultured it in a dish. And they found that this region becomes shorter during, the, during this, this period of time. And so we can include this into the model. We call this epidermal shaping. We can include this in the, into the model by having a region of negative growth or actually shrinkage above the head fold region. Everything else is the same. So if we do that, include that, this is our third hypothesis. The head fold geometry now becomes much better again because that region uh, that shrinking or contracting above the head fold kind of pulls everything downward, pulls this piece downward. The shear strains are still okay. But if we look at the longitudinal strains, which is this, this is a plot of, this is in the, you see this strong concentration right in the middle of the neural plate. This is blown up in the experiment. The, exp the model doesn't predict that. It has like a peak up here and a peak down here, but it doesn't predict this, this strong uh, peak in the middle. So, we we're kind of out of possibilities to try, but one thing that we haven't tried, I didn't think that they had a chance to work, but my student, this was Victor Varner, he thought, well, might as well try it. And, and so, the one thing we didn't try was to make the headful region have a more realistic geometry. Before, it was rectangular in shape. And really, it has this bell shape. And I, I thought, oh, it can't possibly help. But when we, when we do that, we find that we get a realistic head fold shape. And if we look at the, the strains, well, what was not matching before was this peak in the, uh, uh, this peak here in the center of the, uh, a, the axial strains, I guess. And now we see that we do have a peak. It's not quite in the center, so it's still a little bit off, but, it, but at least it's there now. And in addition, we, we, we can look at stress distributions. Now, stresses cannot be measured accurately in vivo. If you, stick a, if you put a probe into the tissue, what happens is you're damaged everything around that probe. And if you just want to measure tissue pressure, you're already, into, you're already damaging the tissue and changing, changing your, your result. So, but one way to estimate stresses is to cut the tissue. That's a common way of, 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 of estimating stresses. And it turns out that in this particular problem, we can punch holes into the embryo. So if we take a micropipette, we can just essentially punch circular holes and then compare the size of the holes and the shape of the holes compared to, to the original uh, uh, size of the pipette. And what we find is that outside the neural plate, the holes become relatively large. This is a, right after we punch them, indicating that this is in a state of tension. Whereas inside the neural plate, the holes become smaller, indicating that there's compress compression within the neural plate. And so we can, again, do the computation with the model, we find at least qualitatively similar, similar results. 
Okay, so what we, what we think is what we, we've gone about as far as we could with modeling more, normal morphogenesis, and now we go to the problem of perturbing the system, which is really the more interesting part as far as I'm concerned, and this is a bit better test of the model. So we did two types of perturbations. So the first thing we did, this is after the head fold is formed, we made cuts on either side of the head fold to relieve the stresses in those regions. And over a period of a few hours, you see that the head fold gradually unfurls from this into this more or less V-shape. The second type of, of uh, experiment is to remove this vitelline membrane before the head fold is formed. This is, again, a cross-section of normal morphogenesis. If we remove that membrane, the head fold becomes a V-shape, very, very similar to this, this case up here. So we simulate both these experiments in the model without changing any parameters. This again was the normal predicted shape. These are, the, are the, the, this is the shape predicted if we make these lateral cuts. Again, we, we see the V-shape, similar to what we saw in the experiments. And if we remove this blue vitelline membrane below, we see again a V-shape. It's not quite as, as, as quite accurate as accurate as this one up here, but it's still in the ballpark. So it seems to at least be predicting the right, the right uh, 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 behavior. And so, the, and so we could continue to, to iterate with this model. There are other things that don't quite match, but really when you get to a model and you, you, you get it to, to where, you, where, you, where you run out of data, then you, you might as well just stop. And to, it's back to, draw, to generate more data before you can go any further. Okay, anybody have any questions yet on anything? Is this sort of a quantitative uh, sort of test to see how good your model matches what data you're trying to model? A quantitative? Yeah, or is it just sort of qualitative? Oh, is this quantitative? Sorry. What I did, well, is what we did here is quantitative or qualitative? Well, I'm saying like okay. once you have your final model, uh, is there like a quantitative test to see how good it is? Well, no. <laughs> I guess the, 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 the real answer is no. So, so the quantitative testing is... is kind of what we did, but we find that, we, for example, I didn't point out, the, the strains, the magnitudes of the strains were too small. So we know that there's something not quite right. But, but, it's, but and so I, I, I don't think you can really match things quantitatively in these kinds of problems. You, you, qualitative is about the best you can do. If, you're, if your orders of magnitude off quantitatively, then I wouldn't accept that. But if, you know, sometimes a factor of 10 is actually considered good. Even in, even in other biological problems, uh, it's, it's, it, makes it, it makes studying biology so frustrating. Because you do one experiment, and you do the same experiment, on a, you, uh, you do an experiment on one embryo, you do the same experiment on another embryo, and the em uh, embryos look identical, but the, the numbers will be off by two or three, or, or maybe even ten times sometimes. It's so frustrating, you don't, you don't really know. Usually you can get it within a factor of ten, I think, and it's good enough. I would, I would like to have it better, but that's, that's just the way. Yeah. So when you uh, measure the shear strain, actually, is it really rel relative shear strain or is it shear strain weight? No, that was shear strain. That was a shear strain relative to the initial configuration when we started. So when you, when you say initial means what you want? So when we start out, we have this flat embryo, and, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's roughly 20 hours old, and before the head fold has started to form, that's the initial state, and then we, the, the strain, so that, that's, the, that's the reference state, and as we, so we, then we measure displacements relative to that state, and compute the gradients, and compute the strains from that. So it, so it changes every, you, you can also, you can also from that data, you can, uh, you can compute the, the strain rates also. So based on that information, you may can actually even generate the visitor stress map, well, the well, you have to know the material properties to get a stress map. Okay, so you can actually poke. And we poke to get the estimates, but but uh, we yeah. So, but that's a, that's a good point. So so, the stress map we got from this 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 the, the punching holes, uh, the poking you know the indentation we can get the material properties, but those are very rough. And again, those are highly variable too. So really, by punching holes, you get. And, it, and you, can, you can get a quantitative measure of the stress by, by simulating the, the whole punching experiment. So you can get a quantitative measure for that. But again, every time you do another step, you're introducing more error. So nothing is really accurate. 
just wonder what's the range of the residual stress? I mean, even oh, the stresses. So, so these embryos um, normally have the, the modulus you can think is, is on the order of 10 pascals or so for a lot of these tissues. Some it's very very soft, and so so the, the, the stresses probably would be on the same order of magnitude. Okay. Yeah. You you can make detailed measurements, for example, of you know this, the, the 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 modulus right. from your indentation. Yeah. And you, you could also probably, I assume, sort of monitor growth by looking at, you know, number of counts, counts of nuclei as a function of position as, and as a function in, of time. In a way, yeah, but it does more than just, it's, it does more than just grow and, and have cells dividing. But yeah, you can do that. You can do that. How much of that information do you feed into the model? Or, or do, you assume, do, you, do you assume, for example, very simple growth patterns, sort of spatial and, and time dependence of of say growth and, and modulus. So this lumps everything together. So you, so so mostly this is shape changing, without without any added added uh, volume. So 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 and, and really, when and when an embryo undergoes morphogenesis, it turns out that cell division. Sometimes it is a big factor, but uh, but most of the time it's not, and and uh, at least in some problems, and and sometimes because because cells to do these shape changes, they kind of have to. All their their cytoskeletal machinery has to be devoted to doing that, and they can't divide at the same time. And and so one thing that's interesting is the heart, when it's when it's undergoing morphogenesis and beating at the same time, and divide, the cells are dividing at the same. How do they do all this at the same time? They can't really. So some cells, apparently, so what happens is some cells do all this complicated stuff, and then they stop doing it, and then they divide and they start up again. And, and and so it's 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 unbelievable even even that they can beat and change shape at the same time. But they they can do that because some some of the uh, contractile some of the cytoskeletal uh, fibers are devoted to beating. Sarcomeres are devoted to beating, and others are devoted to the shape change. So they can do those two things at the same time. But but these models are are really the, a lot of these things are lumped together, right at the moment. So and there's plenty of there's plenty of room for anybody if you want to. <laughs> if you want to get involved with this, there's plenty of there's plenty of room for anybody in these pro in, the, in all these problems. Anywhere you look in the embryo, you find interesting problems that nobody's looked at before, and and I'm always always stunned when it, when somebody tells me about a problem that I've never heard of before. And I I think oh, it can't be mechanics in that problem. It turns out mechanics is everywhere in these problems. It's amazing. Okay. So, so let's now look at, at specific uh, uh, applications. Starting out with gastrulation, which you've heard quite a bit about already. Uh, so a common model for, mo for examining gra gastrulation is the uh, Drosophila embryo, which may, you may, have, may, may probably have seen in some uh, earlier uh, lectures. Uh, so it starts out as essentially an ellipsoidal shape. And what happens is during the first part of gastrulation is a furrow forms along one side. And this is a cross section showing how it invaginates. So there have been uh, several models for this process over the years, beginning in 1981 with a model by Odell et al. And this actually not, was not only a, a model for ventral furrow formation, but it was actually one of the very first models for morphogenesis. And it was a very simple model, but it actually was ahead of its time in many ways. So the model consisted of a ring of truss-like cells. And it's known that in these cells, these epithelial cells, most epithelial cells have a ring of, of actomyosin fibers around the apical side. And when this ring contracts, it, it, it changes the shape of the cell. This is one way of forming a wedge-shaped cell. So that was one piece of their model. The other uh, thing is in their model is that they included mechanical feedback. So they assumed that when, these, when the apical side was stretched beyond a critical value, it would trigger contraction. And this contraction was modeled by a change, a shortening of the zero stress length, very similar to the growth theory that I talked about before. But this was before the growth theory came in, to, was introduced in the literature. Okay, and also this is one of the, actually one of the few models even today that have feedback included. And so what they did was they, they uh, simulated contraction in one cell of the ring, apical contraction in one or two cells in the center here, and that would stretch the adjacent cells, which then would, which then would trigger contraction, 
they would then contract, and eventually you get a wave of contraction that spreads outward from the center and causes, generates an invagination. And by changing the values of the parameters, they can generate different shapes of the invagination. And so in this particular case, they got something that closed off into a, a complete tube. So much more recently, this is, this is uh, you know, more, more than 25 years later, um, Munoz, Munoz et al. published this model. It's, again, a two-dimensional model of a ring of cells. But in this case, they used the rodriguez garot theory to model the changing shape of the cells. They, 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 they specified a growth tensor to, give it a, a, to provide a wedge shape plus a radial uh, expansion, a radial growth. And, uh, that are that's observed because this has becomes thicker, and they also included the effects of uh, th this vitelline membrane that surrounds the embryo is relatively stiff. It constrains the the uh, uh, deformation, and also there's a fluid inside which they model as just a constant volume constraint. And they looked at the so they, if in the in their full model they can get a complete uh, a tube to form as Odell et al did. And they look at the effects. If you remove the vitelline membrane, they don't get the same tube. Uh, if you don't have the constant volume, you can see how the, how the shape is, is changed. And now more recently, uh, Conti et al. extended this model. This is really the same group. They extend this model to three dimensions. Um, and again, this is an this experiment. This is, this is the theory. And you can see how, you can get, how they get reasonable shapes. Uh, another popular model for gastrulation is uh, the uh, sea urchin embryo. On the surface of it, it seems like that the sea urchin may be even a little bit simpler. It's a nice, starts out as a nice fluid-filled spherical ball of cells and it, it essentially indents. It's like if you take your thumb and you press it into a, a, a hollow rubber ball and you push it to the other side, this indentation to the, indentation to the other side, you can see how the, this is the cross section. Uh, gradually, this is the invagination forming here, and eventually extends all the way to the other side to form the primitive gut. Okay? Now, it turns out that this is not all just an, uh, uh, an invagination process. Up to about here, it may be, but then it then sends out little fingers across the other side because it can't, it can't do it. It's on its own uh, through invagination to the other side, so it sends out little fingers and grabs onto the other side and pulls itself over. So, it's important to keep in mind, as far as mechanics goes, that indenting a sphere and is fundamentally different from indenting a spherical shell. And uh, so, the sphere is the, is the sea urchin. The, uh, the, the cylinder is, is more like the cross-section of the drosophila, which is a good representation for that. And the reason for that is because if you indent a cylinder, this is indenting a cylinder, it essentially does that by bending. So the walls just bend, it just, you can push it down, you can feel, you can imagine that if you have a rubber tube and you squish it, it's pretty squishy. But if you have a sphere and the sides from all, all around the, the, uh, ax the circumferential direction have to come in as it indents, as the, as the sides come in, the, there's actually compression. So, so they bend in this way and there's compression around the hoop direction. And, that, so, and, it, and, and if you think about stretching a bar or compressing a bar, it's a lot harder to do than bending a bar of the same material and the same, same geometry. So it requires much more energy to, 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 ex, ex, to uh, stretch or compress the material than it does to bend it. And so it requires a lot more force to bend, to indent a sphere. And in this simple model, uh, this is a cylinder where we specify a, 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 a contraction in this little thin blue region up here of about 20% do about the same in the spherical shell, um, the same, same exact model except it's not a sphere and you get much less uh, displacement here. Also the sides you can see are, are able to, to bend outward in the cylinder whereas they can't. They're constrained by the hoop stress to, to remain essentially the same in the sphere. And a lot of, a lot of uh, people in biology don't really appreciate this. A lot of developmental biologists, although some do. I think Lance does. And in particular, this is one of Lance's models from uh, 1995, where he used a, a spherical model for a sea urchin embryo and investigated five possible mechanisms for this invagination. Uh, the first one 
is simply apical contraction of the cells that I talked about before, which would cause a bending inward of, of the region. And this is a typical shape of one of his models. The other possibility is that the cells on the inside of the invaginal region extend filopodia out between the cells to, 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 to like from here out to here, and they pull everything inward, causing it to buckle. The other, another possibility is that you have a contractile ring around the outside of the dimpled region that it contracts and causes the inside to go into compression and buckle inward. Another possibility is that there's transverse contraction. These cells contract in the, in the, in the radial direction, and when they contract because of constant volume, they extend in the, it, radially, and because of the external con the surrounding constraints, they're putting the compression and they'll buckle. And the, and, the, and, the, and the final one is a differential swelling. There are actually uh, more than one layer here, and one layer swells compared to the others like it grows, differential growth, differential swelling that can cause it to bend inward. And what they did was, with these models, they, 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 they studied what are the mechanical properties that are required uh, to produce each of these shapes. What are the characteristics of the properties that are needed that, to make these shapes possible? And then later on they did uh, experiments where they m measured the stiffness uh, and, and ruled out uh, a couple of these mechanisms. Okay, now I just want to um, mention a couple other problems that this one is, I thought was particularly interesting, relatively recent, ascidian gastrulation, or C-squirt, has actually a different mechanism. So it starts out like this, and, the, and it undergoes, there are two steps. In the first step, these cells in this, in, in, inside here undergo a cell wedging that causes them to change shape and kind of drags these other outer cells around them. And then this contraction is maintained, and then these cells that are wedge-shaped shorten. When they shorten, this is still contracted, so you had, what you end up with is that these extend as they shorten, and it causes the invagination. And they used a relatively simple model to, to show the feasibility of this process. And then I want to mention this gut looping problem. It's even more recent. So when you think about, you know, the gut eventually has to grow and grow and grow, and you have to, has to coil up to fit into your abdomen. And it's, it's, it was not really understood how this happens. Um, and so uh, Savin et al. Uh, studied this problem, and they studied it uh, in using three different models. One was a chick embryo. If they remove the gut tube that's coiled up from the chick embryo, let it uncoil, this is what they get. It doesn't uncoil, uncoil completely because it has this other layer surrounding it, this mesentery that's under tension and, surround, and, and is connected to it. So their idea was that the gut tube grows faster than the attached mesentery, that puts the, the mesentery into tension, the gut tube into compression, and that would cause it to buckle into a shape like this. And they tested this using a rubber tube model, which they built, they, they, they took a rubber tube, and they stretched out a, a membrane and glued it to it, and let it go, and this is the shape they got, very similar to, to the actual chick. And they also used a computer model. Uh, this is a, a spring type of model, but it was in, th in three dimensions, and you can also generate the same kind of shape. Okay, so now let's move on to the problem of new relation. Briefly mention that. This has been one of the most studied problems in morphogenesis, but really, even now, is not clearly understood what are the physical causes of this. And, and what, the, during new relation, this is the first step in the development of the neural system. And what happens is that the neural plate that I talked about before rolls up to create a neural tube, like this. This is a cross-section of a chick embryo over uh, a few hours of development. And uh, so the, uh, the original hypotheses from about 25 years ago were, as, like most invagination problems, that there's an apical contraction that goes on that causes the cells to become wedge-shaped and create this tube. But it turns out that that's not the full story. Some, it may still, uh, uh, may still happen in some of, in parts of the neural tube. But uh, Schoenwolf and colleagues have studied this problem in depth, and they found that really the main changes, cell-shaped changes, occur in three uh, hinge regions, they call them. And they still don't really know what causes these hinges to form, but they noticed that the nuclei of the cells tend to, tend to uh, congregate toward the outer 
the, 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 the convex curvature side of these regions. And so during mitosis in these cells, the nuclei in typically move from one side of the, of, of the, of the uh, wall to the other. They move back and forth across the wall. But in these regions of the nuclei were more highly concentrated on, in, in the outer, re outer side of these, of these regions. And that would cause, because they're crowded, the nuclei are actually wider than the cells themselves. And it would cause this kind of a shape change here as they push apart. And that's called interkinetic nuclear migration. Um, and it's really not even known yet what drives the cells, what drives the nuclei back and forth. There's some hypotheses, some data supporting one way or another. But anyway, so, so, that's, that's, so that was, that's one, one uh, part of the problem. And also there are the tissues on the outside, actually there's a pushing that ha helps to close the neural tube. So again, in our very early model for this, Odell et al., in the same paper, they modeled new relation as well as ventral furrow formation. And they found by, by changing the parameters in their model, they can get this flattening first, which is the formation of the neural plate before it roll up into a neural tube. This again was a stretch activation model for the apical constriction. And then about uh, 10 years later, uh, Broadland and colleagues uh, developed the finite element models for neurulation where they simulated uh, wedging in these hinge shaped regions and they found that you have to have this external pushing for the, for the tube to close. Okay, next problem. So now neurulation starts the development of the neural system, now the brain. So here's neurulation. This is the problem we just talked about. So that creates a neural tube that extends the length of the embryo. And what's, what happens next is that the anterior part of this tube expands to create the primitive brain, and the rest of it will become the, the spinal cord. So this is about, in the chicken, about, these are all chicken embryos, about 32 hours of incubation. Eight hours later, we see that the neural tube, uh, not the neural tube, the brain tube has divided into the three primary vesicles. So you have, you have the forebrain up here, then a constriction, then the midbrain, and then the hindbrain. On the sides of the forebrain, the two optic vesicles are starting to pop out. Next thing that happens is, is that this brain tube seals. It starts to fill with cerebral spinal fluid, fluid that builds up a pressure, and the brain undergoes a period of rapid expansion. And this pressure drives the growth. If you relieve the pressure by, by sticking a pipette in, in the brain tube, it doesn't grow. Yes. This is over a period of, of uh, several hours. It grows uh, several times in size. And here I have a little movie starting out. This is, this is about this, this stage about here, starting out here. And you can watch, you can watch the, uh, the brain tube here. It starts to expand. You can see the heart forming and beating on over here. And then toward the end here, if you watch the eye on the, on the side of the forebrain, watch how the eye invaginates. And I'll be talking about this. So this is a formation of the lens and the retina. Okay. Now, if we compare it to human development, the human brain starts out looking a lot like a chicken brain, at least during the, the first trimester. And then the chicken, the, as the brain grows in human, during the, during the, the uh, third trimester, it starts to fold, whereas the chicken brain remains smooth. So this is where things start really di diverging. Actually, before that, it starts diverging. Okay, so this is called cortical folding, and it's often associated with intelligence. And these are, 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 are images of brains of, of different animals. Usually, brain folding occurs in larger mammals. And so, it's a, again, it's a sign of intelligence, but one exception is the manatee, which is this big animal. It has a smooth brain, and it's also about the size of an orange. If you've ever seen a manatee in a zoo, these are really big big animals. And for a, long, for, for a long, long time, everybody said, this guy has got to be dumb. <laughs> and they always thought, but, but, but testing in recent years has shown that these are actually pretty smart animals, and nobody really knows why manatees are so smart with such a small, smooth brain. So anyway, OK. So as far as development is concerned, uh, these are pictures from MRI 
uh, reconstructions of the ferret brain as it folds. In general, the major, the primary folds might vary from species to species, but within the uh, 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 same species, is, they're pretty much the same from one individual to the next. But then you get secondary folds that can, that, that can be considerably different. This is a cross-section of, of a human brain. It's composed of white matter and gray matter. The white matter is primarily axons. The gray matter consists of axons, dendrites, and glial cells. And the cortex is a relatively thin layer of gray matter on the outside. So, as far as what causes this folding, this obviously seems like a mechanics problem. You have something that's folding, and it sounds like mechanics, and it, and it it's obviously it's a mechanics problem. So, the first model... And so there are two main ideas that, it, that nobody really knows why, how it folds, but there are two main ideas that have dominated thinking on this topic for, uh, for the last few decades. And the first idea, hypothesis one, is differential growth. Uh, where Richmond et al. in 1975 uh, proposed a model where, they, where the cortex, they said the cortex grows, but it's constrained by the inner core, which, which doesn't grow. This puts the cortex into a state of compression causes the buckle. And by choosing parameters that they thought were reasonable, they can, and, and they, can they could compute the buckle length and compare it to measurements, and they found that the buckle length was in the right ballpark for normal and also for abnormal brains. And so there are some other models based on this. This one, uh, 2005, uh, was a similar model uh, and it's also similar to the Odell model. So it's a ring of cells, 2D truss elements, just like the Odell model, but these, but, but these cells are const also constrained by viscoelastic radial fibers in the core. And so as it grows, as, the, as they, they simulate growth in the cortex, it grows, the radial fibers eventually cause it to buckle. Sometimes you get two buckles that will fuse into one buckle. The second hypothesis was proposed by Van Essen, actually one of my colleagues in, in our medical school um, in, in 1997, is called the axon tension hypothesis, where he, he speculated that, 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 that axons connecting two adjacent regions generate a tension to kind of pull these regions together, causing them to buckle and fold. And uh, so neither of these hypotheses have been tested directly in the lab. And that's one reason for that is because it's very difficult to, to study this problem because folding occurs much later in development. You can't culture, you can't just take out a brain and culture it and watch it fold and do things to it. It's just very difficult to, to study. Okay, but so one thing we, you can do, and we, we did this, was to measure stress distributions in the brain. We took slices of, of the ferret brain. So unfortunately, we, we, all of our work in general is done with chickens, but, but the chicken brain doesn't fold. But the ferret brain is nice because it folds during the first few weeks after birth. Okay, so this is a ferret brain six days after birth, 18 days after birth. You can see how the folds have developed during this time. And we can go in there and, and, and oh, and I should also mention that this brain uh, has several layers. It has the, the outer layer of cortex. It has a, a layer of gray matter called the subplate below that, then a white matter tract below that, and then deeper gray matter. So, if you can go in there, and if the study stresses, you cut it. We used a razor blade in this case, and made cuts in different directions, in different locations. Let's just look at these two cases. If we, st if we focus in on, on, on here, this is a, a gyrus, which is an outward fold, the sulcus is an inward fold. We make a cut across the gyrus, Across the radio, in the radial direction across the gyrus, we see that it opens up on the outside and down here in the white matter, but the, the gray matter in between stays relatively closed. And the same in a later, uh, later case. There's some opening down here uh, after it's folded, but most of, mostly stays closed. So this would indicate um, if this opened, there would be significant tension in the circumferential direction, but it stays closed, so there's either a little tension or, or compression. So this seems to contradict the axon tension hypothesis, which requires a tension generated across this direction. So we conclude that axon tension does not drive folding, even though there is, ax there is tension in the white matter. Okay, so one possibility is, th is this other uh, uh, model, if we test, it, well, so the other possibility is the, the differential growth hypothesis, which we can test using a, uh, a model 
similar to those other two models I presented. This is just a slice of a brain. We simulated uh, isotropic growth in the gray matter, puts the white matter into tension, that's the red here. Then we simulate uh, circum circumferential growth in one region, gives one bump. After that stop, we simulate growth in a second region to give a second bump. bump. Also, the region in the subplate is allowed to grow in, in response to the stresses. So it, re so it relieves the stresses in the subplate. And so we get the bumps similar to the experiments. But, a, but again, a better test is by looking at stress distributions or something like that. And so we simulated the cuts in this model in the gyrus, in the sulcus, compared to experiments. And you can see that in the model it opens up on the outside, stays closed, opens up here in the white matter, similar to the experiment. In the sulcus it actually stays closed on the outside and opens in the white matter, similar to what we saw in the experiments. Okay, so, so we conclude that differential growth may drive this folding. Okay, um, just briefly about eye development. A couple of slides on eye development. This is a, 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 a inter another interesting mechanics problem. The, eye, the optic vesicles, again, form on both sides of the, of the uh, forebrain. They actually are pear-shaped. And then they invaginate like this in three dimensions. What happens is the optic vesicle bulges out, it, it grows outward, and it contacts this outer membrane called the surface ectoderm. And when it contacts that layer, um, both these layers thicken to form what are called placodes. And then they both invaginate together. The outer layer becomes, eventually becomes the lens. The inner layer becomes the retina. And so there's, again, there's very little known about the, the mechanisms of this process. So um, Dave Beebe's group uh, speculated this for this, they, they hypothesized the following. They said when the lens and retinal placodes come into contact, the surface ectoderm in, in secretes a relative, re, relatively stiff matrix between these two layers. Okay? So this matrix then constrains future growth. These, these, the cells are still dividing in these layers, and the growth of the optic vesicle, which is the bulging part on, on, the, bot, on the inside, is, is constrained by this matrix, forcing, forcing the optic vesicle to bend inward. Okay, because you have, to, again, it's like a bilayered beam. You have a stiff layer, and you have a growing layer, and it forces an inward bending. So, we created two finite element models for this process. In the first, we have a, a relatively thin layer up here that, that's not growing. A, a region down here, this would be the optic vesicle, uh, the optic, uh, form the optic cup in the future, uh, where we specify fast growth, relatively fast growth uniform growth, and then slower growth outside. And if you watch the model, you see how it invaginates. It looks pretty good up to a point. And then it kind of just stops. And it starts expanding. And this is what it should end up looking like. And it's not, it's not quite right. But if you specify a, a growth gradient where the growth is faster on the inside than it is on the outside of this red region, and, and it and increases from one side to the other. And you watch it, it, it bends inward, it starts out looking pretty much the same as the other one, but the invagination will continue. And it end, it's supposed to end up, you know, these are, these are just supposed to end up all the way up here against here, and it will continue on down. I almost get there. So it's, it's at, least, at least more realistic than... Anyway, so we don't know if there's a growth gradient, but that, that's what needs to be looked at next to see if, if there are, the cells do grow faster here than they do here. Okay, so now I'm going to talk... I want to finish up with heart development. Do I have time? Because I took some questions in the middle. Or yeah. Should I take more questions now? Or? Um, how much more? Um, I don't know, five, ten minutes, I think. That should be fine. Then fifteen minutes for questions, sure. Okay, okay. Um, so during heart, uh, during development, the heart defo uh, uh, deforms from a simple straight tube like the brain into a four-chambered pump. 
The first part of this process is called looping as it becomes a curved tube to move the future atria, the purple region, up to the top. In the chick embryo, this, this looping uh, starts at about uh, during the uh, second day of incubation. In human, it's about the fourth week of, incub of, of development. This is a chicken embryo. You can see the beating heart after two days and after three days of development. Here we have a completely looped tube. Blood comes in one side, goes around the loop, and out through the top. So the heart, first, first, when it first forms, there are two region of, regions of cells, the precardiac regions, that fold over, they fold over, and they, mer they, they merge and fuse along the midline of the embryo to create this tube. And here's a movie showing the creation of the heart tube. So essentially you have these two, these two regions coming together. I'll run it one more time. And it kind of looks like, if it, when I run it, how the, it looks like you pull a zipper from top to bottom to create this tube. So here's the heart tube just starting to form. The brain is forming on the other side at the same time. So you run down here, and now you see the, the, the looped heart, looping heart virtually exploding off to the right side of the embryo. At this time, the heart has three main layers. There's, a, there's an inner layer of, of endocardium lining the lumen. There's a thick layer of cardiac jelly that's all matrix, no cells. And then there's a two-cell thick layer of myocardium that's the developing uh, heart muscle cells. Looping consists of two main processes, um, two main phases. First, there's C-looping, where the straight tube becomes C-shaped. And then during S-looping, it continues to, to bend into a looped heart to form what looks like the future heart. But it's not divided yet. So toward the end of looping, what happens is, is that the heart is, is the embryo is growing, the heart is, needs to pump more and more blood, and to do that, the walls need to become stronger, and so they, they start to thicken, so they, they, so they can pump with more force. But, but early on, there are no coronary arteries, and so what happens is, is that the heart muscle becomes sponge-like trabecular form. And so the blood moves in and out of the wall with each beat and that's how you get oxygen into the heart before the coronary arteries form. And then later on, the muscle, uh, the, these, these holes disappear, the muscle compacts into the layers of, of the mature heart. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about, about looping. It's important to realize that if we put labels on the ventral side of the straight heart toward the end of C looping, they end up on the outer curvature of the loop tube. So it's not just simply a bending of the tube to the right, where the labels might be here in the center, but it's a combination of, of a ventral outward bending and a rightward rotation or torsion. And, and almost, hearts almost always loop to the right side of the, of the embryo. So there are several proposed mechanisms, mechanisms for this process. Uh, the first was proposed by Patton in 1922, where he says that the heart is growing, the cav it outgrows the cavity in which it's contained in the embryo, that puts it into compression and causes it to buckle. But it was then shown 30 years later that you can take hearts and culture them by themselves and they bend perfectly fine. So that takes this, uh, that seemed to rule out this process. You can imagine that, that, that differential growth can play a role where cells may divide faster on the outer curvature than they do on the inner curvature, but Stahlsberg looked at this problem and could find no patterns. So that seemed to rule out that possibility. Manasek uh, studied this problem for many years, and he suggested that, that, that the jelly, this jelly layer, swells as the heart loops. And it does swell. This, this layer grows and swells. And there's a constraint called the dorsal muscle cardium along one side of the tube, which is relatively stiff. And so, like if you put, if you t put a, a piece of tape along one side of a, of a balloon and blew it up, it would bend. That was his hypothesis. But then later on, people came along and took out the jelly. They digested the jelly and found that the heart would still loop. So that took that one out of the, out of the ball game. Another possibility is that you have a differential contraction, whereas one side, one cells on this side may contract longitudinally, causing the heart to bend. But you, if, you use several mice, if we use several mice and inhibitors to inhibit contraction, we find that looping is pretty much unaffected. So this one is gone. 
So it turns out that really nobody, still nobody knows what causes this bending in, in the heart. And it is clear that it's intrinsic to the heart. Uh, the one thing that will, will stop looping is by turning off actin polymerization using uh, drugs such as cytochalase and lutronculin. And so we speculated that it may be it's the forces of actin polymerization that are driving cell shape changes like this to cause this thing to bend, which is, which is still a possibility. But more recently, everybody has studied cell division, but nobody really until recently, Sufan et al., studied the size of these cells. And they found that the, si that the cells actually grow larger on the outer curvature. So this introduces the other possibility that it really is differential growth that causes this looping, even though it's not due to cell division, it's due to cell hypertrophy. But it's still not known. And, okay, so that's the bending part of the problem. Now, as far as torsion goes, torsion is driven by external loads on the heart. Some of these are applied by these two veins that are zipping together to extend the length of the heart. If we look at the cross section, we see also this is the heart, cross section of the, of the chicken embryo, neural tube. This is a membrane called the splenopura that pushes against the ventral side of the heart. So the main hypothesis is that. Uh, um, that these two veins, as they're zipping together, push on the bottom parts of the heart tube and cross section, it gives a little bit of push to the right side, and then this tension in this membrane pushes, pulls the heart dorsally and causes it to rotate completely. Okay, my, my watch is a little bit slower than that, I think. Anyway, I'm almost, I'm getting there. Um, so, we, we created a, a, a fine element model for, a, 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 for a, a rotating a, a, a torsion in the heart where we simulated growth in these two veins. We know that, that there's an increase in cell size and number here. Contraction in the bottom parts, we know there's a contractile force going on here. And we see that it, it does produce a similar rotation to what we see in the experiments. Um, and then we tested the model by doing perturbations where we, where we cut off either the right vein, the left vein, or both veins. And if you cut off the left, the right vein, the heart loops to the right even though it has a normal shape. If you cut off the left vein, it loops to the left, which almost never happens under normal conditions. And if you cut off both veins, it loops to the right, which was a, a surprise. If we simulate each of these experiments in the model, just remove the, left, the right vein, the left vein, or both veins, we see that in each case the model predicts roughly the right shape, including this abnormal shape of the remaining vein here, in the left looping here. So it gives us at least some confidence that the model is correct. And here's a, more, a little bit more sophisticated model. This includes the membrane over the heart, uh, Everything else pretty much the same. A growth here, and also this, these are this is uh, geometry reconstructed from uh, optical coherence tomography cross sections. Okay, so I just want to end up talking about a little bit about the future of modeling morphogenesis, morphomechanics. Um, that that m future models should include interactions between mechanics, chemistry, and gene expression. To date. There are a few models now that, that do do this kind of thing. And most of these models are relatively simple, but, but people are starting to look at this. They need to bridge multiple scales from the molecular to the tissue level. Again, very, very few models have, have, have considered this at all. And models and experiments need to be used to study the role of mechanical feedback. The Odell model included mechanical feedback. That's one of the very few that was done in 1981. Since then, very, very few models have included feedback. But it's, it seems to be an important problem. And just to, just to illustrate this, there's a recent paper by uh, Puel or Pue, whatever, I don't know how you pronounce this guy's name, um, from the uh, uh, Manuel Farge's group, where they took a Drosophila embryo. This is a normal Drosophila embryo, again, showing ventral furrow formation and cross-section here. What they did, what they found was that if you disrupted a couple of genes, you could prevent this from happening. Actually, in one gene in particular, you can disrupt and prevent this furrow from forming. So they did that in an embryo, this embryo down here, and then they indented the re this region here 
a local indentation with a needle for a few minutes and, and then let it go. And that triggered a, 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 essentially a normal furrow to form without the gene. And so this indicates that, uh, and, and there are a few other experiments like this, not a lot of them, just a few. And this is very recent, um, where people have now, now starting to recognize that feedback um, can be a really, really important regulator of, of morphogenesis. Now there's a Russian developmental biologist, Lev Belyusov, who has been talking about this problem since the 1970s. Um, but, uh, but, but he, but some of his, he can't, some of his papers are almost impossible to read. <laughs> I, I, I can under, you can understand if you read about ten times, but this, but this is much more uh, dramatic than anything I've seen from his lab, and that's about it. I just want to point out these are uh, some some of these guys were here, some guys are still here. The guys uh, uh, here in the uh, uh, bold print are the ones who contributed directly to this project. Z up here is sitting here in the third row, so. Anyway, thank you very much. So we have some time for questions. Uh, so currently you do a very like, experimental forward, forward variable selection type of method to develop your model. Um, does anyone do a, like create a theoretical model and then use backward selection? to sort of pare down which parameters are actually used? You mean without experiments? Um, well, like, I mean, develop a theoretical model and then... And then do experiments? And do experiments on that. Well, well, there are a lot of modelers who develop models and that's it. And there are a lot of experimentalists who do experiments and that's it. Typically, um, I... What you, I, you don't start from scratch. You, should, you don't start from scratch with just a model. Um, but, but typically there's very little data there. And so it's almost starting from scratch with a model. You may have a data, you say, okay, well, this is what you see. Can I get a mo have a model that seems reasonable that predicts this? And that's all you know. All you know is you know the shape that it starts out with and what it ends up with. And so there, 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 are, several, there are a lot of models out there like that where you say, okay, We'll just see what it takes to generate the shape. And I, is that, I guess that's what you mean. But, and, and maybe that's, that's as far as it goes. And so at that point, now you need to do experiments to make, because you can generate the shape. There are multiple ways. I, 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 did, I don't know how to emphasize it, but these problems are not unique. There are usually many ways of, of getting the same shape. And so you can have a model, and you, like, like, like Lance Davidson did, he had five different ways of creating essentially the same shape. And then you have to do experiments to figure out which one of these may be correct, and maybe they're all wrong. So, so it is possible to start with a model, but you can't, you can't just stay with a model. You always have to go into the lab. The others? Um, how would you find the endpoints in your model? Is it just once it matches the anatomical organ? Well, no, no, well, no. So matching is the biggest part because morphogenesis really, as long as you get the right shape, you usually don't care how it gets there. So if so, but the problem is you don't know if if you really want to understand what creates the shape. Just matching the shape isn't isn't good enough uh, because again there are multiple processes that can create create the shape and so you don't you should not stop there. If you have the right shape, it's a good start, but you should then investigate to see if the mechanisms you hypothesize are actually true. Because it could be that you could speculate, you know, for bending, the, the, most, the, the most common problem, the most common uh, hypothesis for, for this bending, uh, invagination, and things like that, apical constriction. And it may, or, and it, a lot of times you can get the right shape from that, but it may not be what's actually going on. So, so I would say you, you should not stop at just having the right shape. What about the effect? We're talking about, let's say, differential growth. And the, the assumption is the growth rate is different from one part of the uh, organ uh, to the other part of the organ. And then the shape evolution, the rate of shape evolution, must take certain pace. Mm -hmm. uh, would that match the uh, observation experimentally? Well, it should. It, it, I mean, that's, that's another kind of data that you can use. 
and so what, the, what you need for that is is a time lapse movie that that has enough enough fine you know enough refinement in it so that you can generate these rates but but again now you're differentiating you're differentiating to get the rates and so it's, it's a little bit more error and and because of the variability in morphogenesis from one embryo to the next you you could easily take one embryo and, and, and do a fine analysis to get the rates of all different regions and have all the data, but then, and you're fine. Then you can maybe match that embryo, but then you go to another embryo and maybe it's completely different. So how do you know what's right? It might, you know, one rate might go up for a while, another one may go down and then come back up. And so it's very difficult to, to do it, but, but, but rate, you know, so you add stress, you add strain, and you, you could add strain rate, and, and whatever else you can think of, um, it's, all this is important data to, to, to include. Anything else? In the case of wedging of cells, is, is it known at all what induces the asymmetry in, in the contraction? Level? Oh, between top and bottom? Yeah. Well, well, well epi it's so, 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 right? so, the, so the, the adhesion junctions, Yes, myosin activated. Mm -hmm. So the adhesion junctions are, are, are usually near the apex, and, and they're and they're associated with uh, the actomyosin band. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cells, uh, in the Drosophila dros embryo, it turns out that that is not just the actin is not just in a band around the apex, but actually on the surface of the cell on the apical side, and so the whole thing surface contracts inward. And, and but and in some but in some cases you'll find actin and myosin at the basal side. And sometimes you'll actually get a basal contraction. It's not usual, but that can happen. And, and there's a very recent paper by Wishaus. Wishaus um, they show how the, this actin band can shift. It actually shifts up and down uh, be right before, be before when, right when the cells are ready to, to do this, it moves up. And then it contracts. So, but, so, yeah, I but other than that, I, I, you know, the, the people that identify molecules that are associated with, with this, you know, like shroom and these other things that are associated with, uh, with the movement of the actin, the activation, rho is usually involved somehow in all, this, in all these processes. But why it's almost always on the apical side, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know if anybody knows. Also, I was wondering whether, I mean, to what extent can you can you probe internally during these processes in terms of either putting force probes in or, you know, maybe, like, for example, if, if you put a magnetic particle in a, a certain location, you know, you, with, an, with a magnetic trap, you might be able to oscillate it and determine, say, the, the elastic modulus yeah. as a yeah. function there's of been some. There's been some of that. And there, there are actually some... Uh, some who have um, not too many, where where they inject magnetic particles into cells and pull on them. This that's the perturbation, of morphic. That's a way of applying uh, an internal force. And but there are yeah there are just a very few measurements of, of the properties inside the cells. Um, a very common procedure these days in morphogenesis is to use lasers and cut things. And so you can go in there, and if you can cut a stress fiber and, and, and see, see how it affects things, you can really look at the local level. And, and I'd love to get my hands on one of those lasers. <laughs> I've, been trying to, I've been looking for one for a long time, but don't have one yet. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody else? Okay. So. Good. Thank you. Yeah.